I'm going to formally welcome everyone. So good morning, good afternoon, it's past noon. Uh, Happy New Year. I'm Kata Beilin, Faculty Director of Latin American, Caribbean and Iberian Studies program at UW Medicine. And I would like to welcome you to our new special seminar series prepared in collaboration and co-sponsored also by the Holt Center for Science and Technology Studies at UW Medicine. This series is titled Science and Technology in the Hispanic World, and it features renowned scholars and activists who will introduce science and technology-driven social debates today. Uh, we, Vincenzo Pavone will speak to us from Spain. Next talk on February 23rd will be given by Robin Canul, who will speak to us about and from Yucatan, Mexico. On March 23rd, Craig Hetherington will focus on agribiopolitics in Paraguay. And the last talk in the series on April 20th will be delivered by Birgit Müller, who will talk about the technology and the uh, Nicaraguan agriculture. So let me introduce Vincenzo Pavone, who is one of the key figures in European science and technology studies. Vincenzo is a director of the Institute of Public Goods and Policies of the National Research Council in Spain, and he's the editor of the European Association for the Study of Science and Technology Review, and also a book editor of Science and Technology Studies. He's one of the founders and the coordinator of the Spanish Science and Technology Studies Network. He was also part of the organizing committee of the Society for the Social Studies of Science, so-called 4S, in Barcelona in 2016. Vincenzo's research focuses on the social and political implications of emerging technologies, such as surveillance-oriented security technologies, transgenics and cisgenics, and if someone has a question about the difference, we can explain that, as well as assisted reproductive technologies. Working on the complex relationship between science, technology, and politics, with a special focus on neoliberalism, Vincenzo has opened a new research line on the global bioeconomy. And I have uh, got to know um, Vincenzo's work precisely when I worked on bioeconomy in uh, the context of uh, Latin American agriculture. And um, um, the concept opened my eyes to the very complex relationships between everyday culture uh, and the economy transformed by the scientific modifications of life of plants and animals. And I became very excited about this new angle that Vincenzo's work opened for my own. And I feel very excited being able to share my emotions uh, <laughs> to, uh, with you today during the talk. So please welcome uh, Vincenzo Pavani. Thank you. I hope you hear me. Thank you, Kata, for the introduction. You're very nice. <laughs> um, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's exciting to have this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, uh, through this talk, I'll be going through some of my works in the past and more recent works. But I would like also to say a few words first, as I was asked to do so, and I think it's actually relevant, um, a few words about the SDS network in Spain. It is an experience that was very exciting for several years. It started in 2011 as a result of conversations that I and other two uh, scholars in STS, um, um, that we, Ana Delgado and, and um, his, um, her husband, I don't remember the name uh, now, but um, we were thinking about, that we had to do something like that. And we were in Tokyo at the forest conference in Tokyo then, 2010. And then we started a network with the very few people that we know that were doing STS. So it started as a network, as an informal structure, and it remained so. 
and progressively it extended through the peninsula. So it moved to all the rest of the people doing in Spain, uh, contacted and included people in Barcelona in 2013, and up to people in Portugal uh, in 2017. Uh, and um, throughout these years, he provided the space for discussions, debate, uh, experimental designs, um, collaborative projects, and um, also a space for people to test uh, their knowledge, to explore new ideas. It was a great, a really great experience, which somehow culminated with the organization of the 4S East Conference in Barcelona in 2016. That was a great event. That was, in a way, uh, hard for the, for the network because it was very costly for us to organize that in terms of organization. And after that, we had the moment of um, fatigue, tiredness, and it was difficult to keep going. Besides, and that's the reason why I'm mentioning this, at the moment, the network is somehow on hold, standby situation, because many people that were working actively in the network are either at to move away from Spain because of the lack of job opportunity or are in positions like the one I have that it's very, uh, there's a lot of commitment in uh, management. And um, so it gives us, let's say people that were young when we started are less young today. We, this give us less time to deal with it. Um, there, is a, there, is a, there is hope. I mean, uh, new people are coming up, new postdocs, new PhD students that may be willing to take over with our help. So my hope is in the next year or so, we will be able to set up uh, the network again, perhaps with a, more, um, with a more fixed structure, solid structure and perhaps start having conferences again with the, with the help of the East organization. Um, in this, and, and that's the last thing I want to mention about the SDS network, um, we had very close ties with some Latin American countries, with Argentina, for example, with Chile, um, Brazil, and throughout all these um, years, people from uh, their uh, respective STS networks in these countries joined our conferences, came to Spain, and enriched our debate. Um, so at, at some point, we were really an Iberian network, uh, where by Iberian, I would also add uh, Latin American. Um, so <coughs> hopefully, in the future, we're going to be able to uh, make it start again. Uh, some of the work I present here, uh, it, it's based on some insight from Spain and others are more general about the European Union. What I want to talk to, to you today is about the concept of neutrality in science technology studies. The reason why I want to address this is because I am used to uh, listen to policymakers, interact with policymakers that deal with science and technology or technologies themselves that insist that technology is neutral and it all depends on what you do with it. And it's very hard, it was very hard for me for years to try to show them that it's not the case. This is not the case. There is no such a thing as a, as a neutral technology. Technology comes with values, with visions, with political commitments, and it's our responsibility as STS scholar to put them on the table and talk about them. So the title is Of Neutrality, Science, Innovation, and the Politics of Future. I see, I can move on, yes. Um, I'm gonna talk about, uh, at the beginning, about problems that we have in our world, challenges, and the kind of solution we are trying to uh, elaborate for these problems. And then I move on to another uh, issue, or maybe problem, that is how much does a car really cost? And this will open up some reflection about what we mean by cost. And then I'm gonna try to propose an alternative way of addressing technology evaluation and some new perspectives from social innovation. 
So I'd like to start first with a picture. And feel free to answer my question, feel free to interact. Uh, I took this picture and then I asked myself, what is the problem here? What do we think is the problem here? When I normally ask these questions, I get different sort of responses, but the most common is pollution. So um, let me just make this shorter, yes. And then I ask, how are we going to solve this? And most of the times, what you get as a proposal is an electric car. But the problem here is not really the pollution. It's rather the traffic jam. And electric cars would not solve that problem. But there are other examples. For example, this, what do you think this is the problem here? It's possibly, you know, it's plastic in the oceans. And how do we want to solve this? With some sort of technologies that are able to collect plastics autonomously and um, put them together. Now, I, I say, and th this is not serious because even if we get to have a technology that actually does collect the, uh, the plastic, let's say all the plastic of the oceans in three months. What are we going to do with these plastics? The plastic is there in the ocean because precisely because we don't know what to do with it. And there are several other problems that could be addressed in this way. For example, the loss of biodiversity has been solved or tried to solve through this uh, seed bank. The seed bank that it's in, in Iceland uh, was meant to preserve all the seeds of the world for ages. It got flooded after 10 years because of climate change. And when they, when they stored the seeds, they didn't store the knowledge, the farmer knowledge that is necessary to make this seed thrive again in the future. And there is another one which is closer to my own research uh, interest, which is about the future of the population in the world. You can see there that the problem is that there are going to be a bigger proportion of people uh, older than 60 in the future. We're getting older as a population and the solution we are trying to, or we pretend to, to use is this, egg freezing kit or postponing the motherhood of fatherhood into the late 40s. The problem there is that even if the technology actually works, and, and most of the time it does work, the problem that we have here is that there are people and couples and families that are having their kids in their late, mid to even late 40s when their parents are in their 80s. So these families are facing a crisis of care. They have to care for both the kids, which are very young, and the parents, which are very old. And who is going to deal with this? The reason why I mention all of this as a start, it's because when we face a technology, a technological solution to the problem, we should ask ourselves, if this technology works 100%, do we really solve the problem? Because the, a, a more correct way of addressing the problem is, through a more intense work on the definition. If, you know, uh, a state agency say that the main factors into, to take into consideration for a house is location, location like location. I can say the same for a problem. It's definition, definition, definition. Any solution to a problem will only be as good as the definition we gave to the problem in the first place. SDS scholars, we have responsibility there. Because in our society, when we are addressing these challenges I was mentioning before, we are following a techno-driven approach to problem. And we are overlooking, for example, in the case of the traffic jam, why are people moving and where do they go? In the community of Madrid, as you can see here, there is a huge amount of people that move from the south 
to the center because the South is cheaper. The houses in the South are cheaper. So this, this is more than just a pollution and traffic jam problem. It's also a housing problem. And it, I could say the same about plastics. And I could say the same about the generation of CO2 and about uh, the uh, precarity of the job markets in young people, which make for them impossible to have families or to buy a house until they are in the early 40s. So if I can say something about all this innovation, what do they share? They share a similar approach. They are individually focused. They do not question current social and economic practices, and they take the existing social order as a given. Now, more than innovation to save our planet from climate change, this in innovation try to save capitalism from climate change. It's a different thing. Now, I'm sure we, we as scholars in SDS agree that science is a social practice which works through institution norms, rules, funding bodies, evaluation, incentives, like any other social practice. So what we do in science is producing situated knowledge, which is reliable, validated, and falsifiable knowledge, but if, which is also shaped and constrained by existing political, social, cultural, and economic institutions. That's why I say we cannot really claim that technology is neutral. The problem we are facing in our society most of the time is that we look at uh, social problems because the problems I was mentioning before are not merely technical. They are essentially social problems through technical solutions. Climate change, contamination, aging, migration, energy, waste, even cancer, they all share fundamental social components and they are way too complex to be solved only through technological innovation. So we have to change our premises and think of what we may call socio-technical innovation, a mix of social and technological innovation that is capable to have simultaneous co coordinated impact on both science and social practices. We need to change technology as we change society. But before we can do that, we need to address our technology and actually do a checkup of what they are and how they work and with what consequences. So what I propose here is uh, a, a new approach that it's published in one of my article 2011 in context trajectory evaluation. So we should ask questions like, when we have a technology that we have to evaluate, we should ask questions like, what was its purpose? Has it achieved it? What other problems has it generated? And who is paying for the unexpected consequences? How can we reframe the problem that this technology was meant to solve? And finally, and possibly most importantly, are there available technology that can be combined? What values do these technologies embed? We have a responsibility to address this question when we do technology evaluation. So, Again, a little uh, overture, how much does a car cost? If you look at the website in Spain of a BMW, this one in particular, I think it's the X5, you get this answer, 78,400 euros, ready to drive. But is this the price that this, act, this car actually costs? Now, I believe that this answer, the 78,000, euro is actually wrong or at best only makes sense from a very specific ideological point of view and i'll try to show why is this relevant as you may all intuitively perceive a car can only function in the presence of at least these elements you need roads gasoline pumps you need um, people that can repair the cars if they have problems driving school ambulances police, norms, and so on and so forth. Without all this infrastructure, which is technical and social at the same time, the car simply doesn't make any sense. So <clears throat> it becomes a meaningless object, 
a box with four, five seats and, and four wheels. Obviously, if we focus only on the transaction between the buyer and the seller, the car actually costs only 78,000, depends on the, on, on the country. But in this way, what we're doing, we are removing from the picture and from the transaction all the infrastructure costs and the environmental damage of this object, of this technology. And we do so because we accept that this cost should be paid by the collectivity as we consider the car a legitimate way to move around. However, as you can see, if you take into account all the effort the public authority and the collectivity in general have to make to ensure a functional working environment for us to use the car or for the car to make sense, the cost of a car is much higher. This technology of mobility called car cannot be understood or assessed separately from the related societal, institutional and infrastructural elements. I'm using the car as an example because it's very familiar to all of us, but this kind of questions can be applied to all sorts of technologies. But before I move to the actual proposal, there's a, uh, another little question. By the way, why did we end up moving by car? Now, I think I, I, I want to share with you that when I was visiting Berkeley in 2008, 2009, I went to a seminar and they were talking about the difficulties of switching from the cars to trains in California. Now, obviously, the idea was to be able to abandon fossil fuels and, and the carbon economy and move to a more collectively and sustainable economy. The point is that the way California in, uh, this was actually structured geographically and the urban uh, context made it impossible to actually find a place where to put the train station. So it is so fragmented that it was very difficult to actually find uh, a place to, to put the train station. The point is that we started to use the car as a way to move from one place to another. But as we all adopted the car and we all moved by car, essentially what we do, we, we started to live farther and farther away from the places that were, that were meant to be the main important places of our life. The supermarket, the schools, um, the center of the city, our friends. And in the end, we still, we actually spend the same time moving as we did before the car. We just do it seated on a car. So, <clears throat> as you see, is the car the solution or the problem? I think it's important to try to address technologies in this open way so that you can see the different aspects of, of its implementation. Now, I think that from this um, over tour that we have um, done so far, uh, there are a few lessons that we can learn. First, technologies only make sense in relation to the social technical infrastructure that produce and support them. Two, the implementation of a new technology, whatever that is, bears more costs than their contingent market price. And three, what in a given context may emerge as a solution could easily turn out to be the very source of a new problem. So technology assessment needs to consider not only the risk benefit relation, but also how problems and solutions are framed how the technology is likely to inter interact with this context, the social institutional context, and what it's likely to be the impact on ex existing relations between citizens and their environment. We need to do all of that as the STS scholars. And um, here's where I propose this uh, new approach it's called in-context trajectory evaluation. First of all, we have to ask ourselves, how are benefits and risk redistributed in the society? And then problems that may have emerged as a result of the interaction of different social, political and economic factors are usually framed in technological terms, paving the way to solutions that do not call into questions non-technical factors. This is why our first step should be to work on frame analysis, the way 
Jasanov, Sheila, Jasanov defined it. Principle of selection, emphasis, and presentation, composed of little tacit theories about what exists, what happens, and what matter. Let's, let's use this example uh, that I saw in one airport, in Brussels airport a few years ago when I was going through the airport, was Syngenda trying to frame the problem of water scarcity as a function of GMOs. Now, as water becomes a scarce resource, how do we conserve it? Grow less food, grow food that needs less water. Now, if you frame it like this, what are you going to answer? Obviously, grow food that need less water. But the problem here is that the water scarcity is framed as a function of water consumption by conventional crops. Frame, framing water scarcity as a technical issue paves the way to a technological solution, obscuring the whole array of social, economic, and political factors that have resulted in the overuse of water, increased pollution, and obviously the responsibility of the innovation regimes itself. Clearly, if technology is the solution, the progress depends on full access to this technology. And as you may imagine, whatever obstacle preventing the diffusion of this technology has to be removed. So <clears throat> essentially, framing social problems as technical questions end up diverting responsibility from political actors to techno-scientific networks. Depoliticizing controversial policy domains. Again, I'm, I'm quoting Jasanov. So um, one way to address this, obviously, is to study the trajectory of a technology through the lens of co-production. We know that technology and society and social order are co-produced. They emerge side by side. So risk assessment procedure should not only ad uh, normally do not address the vision and imaginaries that sustain a given technology. Although these visions and imaginaries did play and keep playing a crucial role in the development, regulation, and implementation of the technology at stake. We have to address these visions and imaginaries. They should be the object of our research. But then, after we have done this, there is another question to ask. Is the context safe? Most of the time, we address the issue of whether the technology is safe. But technologies never operate outside the biophysical context. And it is in there in the action with this context that they generate effects and impacts. So we have to study the context. Is, is the context safe? We cannot expect assessment of risk to produce uniform outcomes around the world. So in order to identify and evaluate, evaluate potential harms and benefit of a technology, we must know how the technology is likely to interact with the context. In the case, for example, of the EU and GMOs, the EU recognize that it's important to make reference to the interaction of GMOs with the biophysical environment, but it has no methods in place for acquiring such knowledge. And there are important studies in the 90s that I'm sure you all know. Win, uh, Brian Wynn Prost Chernobyl study on the importance of farmers and shepherd knowledge, and Irving study on pesticides also showed how practices are relevant because sometimes normative regulations are simply impossible to be reproduced in the fields. Most of the time what we are doing uh, when we do technology assessment is that we assess the risk but we assume the benefit. And, and that's also another problem because um, we should address and assess the benefits. These benefits are normally used as a benchmark to decide whether given risks are acceptable. And we have to study who is actually enjoying the benefit and who is paying, who is uh, at risk, because most of the times they're not the same people. So there is very little work done on this specific uh, set of questions. Seed choices, Best management strategies, cropping patterns, and farming systems are all embedded in a particular household of farmers' wider livelihood strategy, which in turn is embedded in a set of social and institutional relationship and processes. That's Glover 2003. So we have to address that as well. 
and also the economic feasibility. The case of dairy farmers interviewed in New Zealand, it's an interesting, interesting work made by Joanna Govan, showed that the rules of keeping containment of bio, bio farming cows in New Zealand were simply impossible to be, to be adopted in, in, the real, in the real world because coexistence was not possible physically. Uh, the, the, the farmers had to opt out from Fonterra, which is the cooperative that, that manage uh, milk in, in New Zealand. And that was economically not viable. They were vulnerable for market exposure if they only uh, uh, bet on uh, biofarming. And it was very difficult to comply with the containment rules. Uh, and, and they could not rule out human error when even, even when strongly sanctioned. Essentially, it failed precisely because it was not possible to uh, implement biofarming in New Zealand in a, in a, in a reasonable way. And, and this, was, this was the case because they didn't study how safe was the context, not the technology. And last, there's a third step, which I think is also quite important and should be conducted with STS scholar, but also with environmental scientists, I think. Technologies have an impact also, not only on the environmental context, but also on the way people feel, live and interact with these contexts. They have impact on social practices, meanings, actions, relationship. If we change, if we introduce new technologies, we are going to change all of these practices and the social relational domains that are constructed around them. We have to ask these questions because, for example, in, in Spain or in Italy, for that matter, there are a lot of DOP products, products that are specific to single regions, sometimes to single valleys. And there are communities that are built around these products. Any changes in the way we produce food in these areas are going to disrupt the very coexistence of these people the very way of life of these people. So social analysis need always to be integrated when technological assessment is performed, precisely because it's not the same to have GMOs in open fields in, for example, say the, uh, in the middle of the US or in other countries where there are big open plains uh, to introduce GMOs in small closed valleys that was economies based on uh, DOP products. Now, um, if we go back to our traffic jam story, I think there's an interesting lesson that we can learn from social innovation. This idea of combining technology and social uh, innovation for a, new, uh, for a new approach to innovation. Um, the story of the electric car in Madrid is especially interesting here. Uh, at the beginning, there was uh, a collective system of car sharing called Respiro that were, they were just gasoline cars that were parked in specific parking slots. And so if you want to take the car, you have to go to this parking slot and bring it back to the parking slot. This didn't work very well. Um, and in the meanwhile, electric car arrived in the market. So some people, those who could afford this, start to buy uh, these cars. They were expensive, difficult to charge, have limited autonomy. This didn't really work either because of this reason. The big change was when the two things were combined. ZT, for example, or Car2Go or eMove and Weeble are all system of shared cars in Madrid, car sharing. I, they are electric. They work with geolocalizations in a mobile app and they are working day and night, basically nonstop. I think it is interesting to know that the first two years that these electric cars were introduced in Madrid, they covered the same distance between the earth and Mars. And that was only Madrid. I'm talking about 48 million kilometers. This was an um, amazing, success of the car sharing. So <clears throat> what if, that is the big question. 
that we should ask at this point, and I'm coming to the end of the conversation of, the, of, of this talk. In the autonomous community of Madrid, the large majority of people drive a car to drop kids at school and go to work. They live in the south where the housing market is more affordable. They work either in the center or in the north of Madrid. And so essentially they have to take the car to do both things, drop the kids, get to, get to work. If you do that on a public transport system, it takes you ages because of the changes. Large companies, offices, and corporations have their headquarters in the north of Madrid because this is where they use traditionally to have their um, headquarters. And also because in this way, the connection between these companies, it's easier. This generates a problem of massive mobility from the south to the north of the community of Madrid. Um, now, the what if question is, if instead of reducing emissions by changing the engine or trapping CO2, why don't we give people a chance not to move at all? That's another way of addressing the problem that also requires technology, but a different one. Instead of changing engines, what we can do is connect problems. Housing needs, transportation habits, educational needs, and working modalities. There is a huge amount of jobs that are in the service sector that could be conducted remotely. Now, if we recombine existing digital, digital technology, you may have people working in co-working spaces, but all over the community of Madrid. They could go to, the, to their job, to their physical headquarters, maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, but they could live and work in a different village. Obviously not from home, because from home, working from home generate other sorts of problems that are difficult to tackle and may, may, may create psychological problems. So you still have an office, but it's an office in the village where you can afford the house, have a better life, uh, you have a higher purchasing power, kids go to less crowded school with more affordable houses, more active life, and they only move the car if they want in the weekend. And the companies could reduce the size and cost of their headquarters by doing this. And most importantly, if people change their jobs, they can still work from the same place. They just change the company but not the place. It's an idea, uh, has not been tested. It's something that I come up with, uh, but it's something I, I, I'm up, it's up for discussion because I think it could really make a revolution in the mobility and in the living standards of many people in Spain. So if I can wrap, wrap it up, I would suggest that there are a number of uh, take home messages we can take. One, science is a social practice, but I think we all know that. That technological solutions that aim at solving a problem uh, to ensure the social order remain unaffected are a problem themselves. Any so so solution to a problem will be as good as the definition we give to the problem in the first place. Technologies only make sense in relation to the social technical infrastructure that produce and support them. The implementation of a new technology bears more costs than their contingent market, market price. And what in a given context may emerge as a solution could easily turn out to be the very source of a new problem. So we need to go beyond risk assessment and assess the technology into a more holistic approach, which I have defined in context trajectory evaluation. An alternative is possible through the combination of different but related problems and the integration of social and technological innovation. So I've come to an end. I'm very much looking forward to your questions. And thank you very much again for inviting me.